So welcome to our featured keynote. Um, we are in the third month of the um, online conference series for the Peace and Justice Studies Association. Uh, this year we had three months of programming. We started with a month dedicated to uh, restorative justice. Um, and then we followed that up with a month of uh, storytelling and narratives and the role that they play in our commitments to uh, restorative justice and peace. Um, and now we're in our final month of talking about polarization. And this is part of a larger kind of commitment by our organization to really reflect on what we've always known would be a very, very divisive election. Um, you know, culminating at the end of a very tumultuous um, first term of a presidency that we've had lots of opportunities to think about our strategies for resistance and engaging with people and trying to figure out how we would um, stay committed, but simultaneously not um, push people away when there was opportunities for bridge building and so forth. Uh, when we talked about speakers to bring in, um, there's just so many good people and so many important voices. Um, there was immediate consensus um, between the, all of the members on the committee that we wanted to bring um, Dr. David Ragland in to talk about um, the work that he does. Uh, I feel very lucky because uh, just a few weeks ago, we were celebrating the 10th anniversary of Cuyahoga Community Colleges peace and conflict studies program. And without any prodding from me, they had selected him because he's a native uh, from Ohio um, or had lived in Toledo. I can't remember exactly what the explanation was, but they brought him in because of his proximity and his early involvement in, in, in peace and justice studies in Ohio. So I'm getting a chance to just hear from him again. Um, and part of the theme for uh, introducing him was actually not to try to talk about many uh, accolades or accomplishments, things that he's been recognized for, although it really is worth saying that his work to help Cori Bush win is something that like the enthusiasm is just very real. Um, we're, all, we're all happy to see that success, but for me, the story is actually just a very personal, like just basic ordinary story that I've been telling people and trying to not to be too political that the Peace and Justice Studies Association's annual conference is like my trip to Disneyland where I see people that I love and I recharge my batteries. And so uh, it was my second PJSA, it was my first year in my PhD program and I took my camera with me <laughs> to Boston and I was taking pictures of the sites, the surroundings and going to panels. And it's like the, the first lunch break of the first day of the conference. And I, I said to the two people sitting next to me and David Ragland was one of them, like wanna grab lunch. And I can't remember anything, I was exhausted. Like the conference gave me so much to think about, like I don't remember, but it was just a friendly, uh, a friendly humility that you know we just broke bread together. And that's what we do as an organization. We, we get to know each other, we get to appreciate each other. And then, you know, years later, it wasn't by accident that I had seen him present on truth telling and then cited him in my dissertation because I think that the work's really incredible. Um, tonight, he will be giving a talk about truth telling and uh, a time of polarization um, and couldn't be happier to have the opportunity to introduce you. And he'll give a talk, this will be followed up by um, an opportunity for question and answer. And um, I would say, you know, we just can't be happier to have you tonight. Um, floor is yours. I'm gonna share my screen. I appreciate that, uh, William. Um, let me get my sharing started. Okay, can you all see that? Okay. So um, it, it is really good to be here um, as well. 
uh, because of uh, my connection with many of you um, in this organization. Um, I'm really thankful to um, those PJSA members who were there and helped us start the Truth Telling Project. Um, for, I don't know if people know, but um, PJSA gave us um, our original funding. And when Mike Brown was killed, I was in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and I was uh, a, a, on the board and uh, just a few uh, people, you know, we had conversations about what was happening in Ferguson and PJSA wrote a statement and that to a large extent started my work in my own home community um, around truth telling in Ferguson. Um, but so before I get moving, um, I want to um, welcome my ancestors. Um, and I'm just gonna take a moment. I meant to do this earlier and light a candle. And I encourage everyone on the call to add your pronouns. And um, the original uh, indigenous inhabitants, the land that you are currently on. And you can also add that in the chat feature. So I am, um, and, and I wanna bring in, in ancestors because of, um, I believe part of where we are in this moment is uh, a really profound disconnect with our ancestors. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and this is, is my um, grandmother, Moselle, um, who I'll talk about in my talk on one end who, with my father, uh, picked cotton until her husband, my grandfather died uh, in Tennessee. Um, and, and my father picked cotton up until he was 12. And then on the other side is my grandma Goldie, who uh, was half, half, Black and Indigenous, um, and grew up in Detroit, um, between Detroit and St. Louis. Um, so uh, I would ask if um, people would also like to name some ancestors um, in this moment to honor. Um, I'd also like to call out um, Queen Mother Moore, a reparations pioneer, um, I would like to also uh, name Thomas Sankara. Uh, I would also like to name um, Callie House. Be with us as we talk and connect. We honor you, we thank you for bringing us to where we are to be prepared to survive. If you have something, light it. Cause I'm saying all this shit today. So, you know, I, I, I do think the this title is really appropriate. And you know what, before we go on, let me just go back for a second.
And I just want to look into the chat feature and see some people. Let me give folks, if, if everybody can be unmuted for a second, um, I ask people to just name their ancestors right now. If you had ancestors that you thought about and you want to name. Well, David, I'm thinking of my grandmother, Julia Vivian, who was part Cherokee and lives to be 95 years old. So my children got to know her. Hmm. I'm thinking of her tonight. I see. I think of my father every time I put on a tie. He passed away the year that I presented at my first PGSA. I bring him in, into every presentation when I wear when I wear the tie. I say. I say. Okay. One of my great grand <clears throat> great grandparents on my mom's side. Uh, Khalil and Anisi Atiyah, which were the generation that emigrated from Syria. Here's my uh, great grandmother. Ooh, you can't see her. Hmm. My great grandmother. Paula Claster, who was born in uh, uh, Romania, Yasi, Romania, who really regretted that she couldn't get an education and she decided all her daughters would get one. And I'm, this is my great grandmother. And Talia, you couldn't say anything. Something was wrong with your. Can you hear me? Maybe, feel free to type it. We can hear you, but it sounds distorted. Ashe. Um, I just, I really think it's important to honor our ancestors because they are who we are. Um, they're. We, we inherit their, their genetic, um, their genes, um, and they also shape our lives um, in ways that we can't even imagine. I say to you. All right. Um, and so I want to jump into this conversation. Uh, around polarization uh, or truth telling in a time of polarization. And I put this up here because um, part of part of what this um, sorry, this infographic shows um, is essentially like the way that um, people in the United States have sort of went between um, sort of conservative uh, and and is here is listed as Democrat Republican, but I think it's a good way to think about um, conservative liberal ideology. And I and I and so, but I also just want to point out I think that you know polarization is a really important thing to talk about. Um, but um, and I and I'm going to share this slide. So if you have specific questions, I can also share the citation as well. Um, but this is this is where I think the polarization come from comes from. I, I just want to submit that we aren't necessarily polarized in this moment. Um, it's that a moment that we've been building up to. This society has been building up to, um, and you know, this is finally like this moment where at least a quarter of white people in this society have accepted that there's something wrong with white supremacy. Um, some of those white folks have began taking the streets, uh, began supporting, making reparations. 
I think an, another quarter of white people in America believe in white liberal democracy, or at least say they do. And, and um, I am gonna make a value judgment about that at some point. And then I think the other half of white people believe you know, what they've been taught, like that this American dream, um, that, that there's this American dream to believe in. Um, and that what, what this, what, where we are is a buildup, I think from um, what is essentially um, a lie or, or lies, stealing, right, theft of land, um, like this current president, you know, has, is, is, has popularized incompetence, um, you know, selfishly in, engorging, you know, oneself and then getting away with it. And so I wanna put in, in the camp, in this particular camp, like this other half of like, you know, white people who believe in this American dream and all of this, I wanna put the white folks who don't listen to and let people from impact the communities lead. Or white folks who still don't understand that publishing books or getting semi woke black and brown folks to co-author with you in the name um, of like helping your career or kind of putting them on. Um, that That is also a part of this camp that I find really, really problematic. Um, and so I think polarization just, you know, and I'm just kind of like talking and thinking about some ideas um, um, that I've been thinking through in this past time. Uh, but polarization is, is, I think, a result of white supremacy, this silencing of truth in service of economic prosperity, and then reliving the same drama, or not even drama, but trauma, and failing to, as, as Rasma Makam writes in his book, My, grandmother, My Grandmother's Hands, it's the, the failure of white people to actually address trauma, address their own trauma. And so, um, and, and I'll get into this, but Michel Foucault writes in Society Must Be Defended, he writes about how Europeans were colonized by feudal power and how that feudal power essentially uh, began to replace uh, traditional religions and also helped to create the nation state and was the beginning of the creation of capitalism. And if we think about that this notion that white people have been traumatized, um, we have to understand that in this historical context, white people have been traumatized by capitalism and all of the white people who came to this country came escaping something or running for something and never dealt with that trauma. So imagine all of the other people that came in contact with white people, like the indigenous people of this land dealt with a group of people who were traumatized and I'm not, I'm not sort of saying this to let anybody off the hook. I'm just speaking to a failure to address trauma. Um, and we can see this, you know, this is why, for instance, ta Coates describes uh, the importance of uh, reconnecting with one's ancestors or, or the way he talks about white people being disconnected from their ancestry. And so one of the things that we, we might talk about then is truth um, in this particular moment. And I wanna, I wanna just talk about um, 
if we think about this this country as um, beginning as this uh, nation, um, or not even nation, but this colony where people were enslaved, um, and at the at the Constitutional Congress, um, the founding fathers had a conversation, according to historian Joseph Ellis. And the conversation um, was around the moral conundrum of, of slavery. And how do we, if we're creating this free society, this liberal democracy, how do we actually, um, how can we create this? Like, how are we even having a revolution? Um, and so we all know about the three fifths uh, of a human plan. Like we all know that that there was uh, a decision to we're going to go ahead with slavery because uh, the white people won't do it. And what this particular historical moment did was it reinforced um, this notion of silence historical silence. Because while they were having this discussion, what is not necessarily reported and what Joseph Ellis reports is that the founders had agreed among themselves to not have um, not have it publicized that they had even had arguments and discussions around the morality of slavery. And they, they waited until the generation of that founders, of those founders died to even um, put it out there that there, there had been this debate that the Quakers had came in and offered a petition to end slavery. And so when we, when we think about the impact of silence around or on the American populace at the time of uh, this sort of reinforced hierarchy, this domination, this beginning of social norms, this uh, creation of um, elite power holding uh, people, then we can also connect that to the fact that we weren't even talking about indigenous people whose land had been stolen. And so I think for me, that's the first piece in this in this puzzle about thinking about like why are we polarized in this moment and so after the revolutionary war um you had mary wollstonecraft shelley who wrote um vindication of the rights of women and in it she argued that it wasn't a revolution essentially because um there had been slaves and that there was no education for women included in the Constitution. Um, and at the same time, what if the United States would have stopped after the Revolutionary War and took stock, realized like, all right, we just created a, a new nation. What could we do so that we can live up to our values? And so that's sort of this, this failure that continues throughout history uh, or throughout this kind of history. And so then uh, Derek Bell, who's the founder of critical race theory, he makes the argument that there was this moment even before the revolution when um when africans were introduced into uh this society and that introduction um according to him was was very different right because um there were um indentured servants uh, but those indentured servants could be free. There were indigenous people, but it was often hard to keep them enslaved. 
um, uh, for various reasons. Uh, they also knew the landscape, but the introduction of black slaves, uh, black people who were in slaves into this economy, I think created the at least I'm not a nigger moment because all of a sudden you also have people um, who from birth to death um, are miserable, like their children will be slaves, their bodies are not their own. Um, and so we can even scoot on down history and look at the election of 1860 that set up or laid the groundwork for the Civil War, um, where Lincoln won electoral votes, but then he lost uh, the popular vote. But that's not the, the point in history that I, I, I really think is of note. I think the, the piece like post Civil War, when the United States could have stopped for a moment and said, maybe here is a moment uh, to think about what happened, to think about what we did during slavery. Uh, but instead, one of the only sort of lasting acts that we're, we're dealing with in this moment was the when um, Lincoln was assassinated um, and the new president came in who, who, who backed out of reconstruction um, and also retracted uh, Field Order 15. Field Order 15 was the um, order 40 acres and a mule, right? That redress for slavery. So one of the only processes like in that early history that could have uh, addressed um, the, the institution of slavery um, was ended early. Um, all of the progress made during reconstruction um, reversed um, and the one beginning act for repair um, that began uh, was backed out of. So I think, I think the, the, the point that, that I'm trying to began, and I hope folks are seeing it, is just that there have been all of these points throughout history when our society could have took stock, made um, amends, um, figured out like the harm, uh, addressed trauma, and this country never did. And in this slide, um, this is my dad when he was around 12 years old. And the scene next to it, um, there's a, a woman in, in cotton fields, a woman and a man, and then there's a, a, a white guy um, holding cotton. Um, for me, I see my own story as sort of weaved into to the American story of inequality. Um, in the sense that, um, you know, throughout, up through, even after Reconstruction, uh, when Black people are forced back onto plantations, into systems of, of sharecropping, um, that slavery continued um, after that. And if these are... Uh, um, paintings from Jacob Lawrence, who uh, painted the Great Migration. And the painting, uh, these paintings, it's about 20 of them, and they depict Black folk uh, leaving the South. Um, and so the, the, the top two uh, pictures or paintings um, show Black people headed out through uh, to train stations going to Chicago, New York, and St. Louis. Um, and then the bottom right picture speaks to what Black people experienced when they came to Northern cities, police violence. And so I can see my own uh, story being reflected um, in our history. And 
how, you know, even um, th this system, you know, many people asked me how, how did we, how did our country get to Ferguson? How do we get to, to that point in 2014? And, you know, my answer was that we were already there um, throughout history, you know, we had continued to experience violence and um, even the great migration is, is a problematic term. We should be calling it the escape from a uh, racial terror in the South or something like that. Um, but Ferguson and many other movements like it that we are experiencing now was essentially um, just sort of um, a result of all of this historic violence and trauma coming to a point and people paying attention. And so what Ferguson for me was really trying to respond to was the, mo the movements that have been unrealized. Um, so for instance, the civil rights movement um, was really important, right? Because it was, is really about, you know, becoming visible in this system, having our, having our lives at minimal uh, be protected uh, under um, legal framework or having the laws that were currently on the book um, to actually be listened to or applied. And what, what was so difficult and, and why Ferguson happened uh, was in part because those movements up until Ferguson and even in, with Ferguson, which is why we're in this current moment now, they um, were important, but um, you know, Derek Bell writes about this too uh, but what they did was civil rights essentially happened, civil rights legislation passed because um, white liberals, white elite liberals were interested in it. And also because the United States was, um, had a, 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 a extremely horrible reputation abroad. Um, and so uh, the US, uh, civil rights essentially provided the U.S. Uh, cover as it battled communism abroad. Um, and even through the support of colonial uh, or wars against colonism, co colonialism and um, places all over the world uh, where the U.S. was um, quote unquote fighting communism. And so the civil rights era um, essentially um, was still uh, being uh, uh, sort of addressed. And we can even look at it in terms of legislation. And I'm, I'm thinking about three particular uh, legislations. So the Fair Housing Act, and according to the Center for Investigative Journalism, um, the Fair Housing Act um, presided over decades of gentrification uh, under Obama and then under Reagan and uh, Trump with these things called the enterprise uh, zone, uh, which were essentially about bringing housing into urban communities. But what they essentially did uh, was empower wealthy developers. And then um, there was also affirmative action um, one civil rights legislation um, that essentially um, where white women most benefited from this particular civil rights era legislation. And then voter rights, um, which has been rolled back. And So I think in, in Ferguson, we were still dealing with not being visible and not being a part of the system. And 
you know, um, as I as I mentioned earlier, um, when Michael Brown was killed, um, I was uh, acting as a representative for Peace and Justice Studies Association, and we put out a statement condemning police violence, um, and then. Um, as time went on, a number of activists, uh, Corey Bush included, uh, Mama Cat and I, and, and a number of the local folks, we started the Truth Telling Project. And we started the Truth Telling Project um, because we thought it was really important that people be allowed to tell their own stories, that people's stories uh, matter more than the official narrative. Um, we didn't call it a truth and reconciliation project or process because from our perspective, um, we, you need both parties, um, number one, the party that's victimized to tell their stories. And then those who have been, um, who's had harm inflicted upon them, um, and then the victimizers themselves to, to be willing to come to the table. And from my experience, we didn't think that um, the, victimi the victimizers, police, um, and then the people who support police um, would actually be willing uh, to admit that there was something wrong with killing Black people. And so in that sense, we brought people from around the country to tell their stories about being victimized um, by police violence. And in this slide, these are um, the siblings of Mike Brown um, Saint Jr. And um, so what, what we're really talking about here is what kind of education, what kind of um, narrative are we going to, to listen to as a country? And, you know, from, from this work, um, and let me, I'm doing a bunch of stuff. I think from, from this work, like understanding that our country has this historical problem with truth, you know, from slavery, from the Constitutional Congress. Um, but then that there has been, I think, tremendous um, sort of this context of um, producing ignorance. Um, I don't know if people remember the, the textbooks that said that, um, you know, Black people were transported as servants to the United States or, um, you know, uh, taking things like um, critical race theory or um, banning, um, you know, subjects of study um, from schools, uh, for instance, when Jan Brewer, um, the governor of Nevada banned ethnic studies, um, this was all trying to reinforce a particular narrative. And truth telling, I believe um, is, is a decolonial effort. Uh, Imani Scott says that uh, truth telling is the first step in a moral inventory, uh, meaning that uh, people whose voices have not historically been honored should be honored, um, meaning that, um, that we should be listening to communities uh, that are experiencing trauma uh, and letting them get themselves and fix their own problems. A uh, meaning that um, rather than going to a country to fix them, uh, maybe finding the groups that are doing the work and figuring out how to support their work. Um, 
So for me, truth telling essentially reverses this dynamic of this scholar, intellectual, um, activist, organizer, practitioner, um, sort of giving uh, this kind of knowledge uh, to, to another group. Um, and, and I've always found this particular, particularly troubling uh, because, you know, um, I've, you know, throughout my entire education experienced, um, you know, people coming into my community and telling us what to do and then leaving um, or um, scholars who come in and you know, write a book about your community and then they're out. Um, and just, you know, people finding so many ways um, that seem uh, benign to really come into communities and disrespect what people are trying to do. And for us, that was the motto of truth telling. And so um, I think in this particular moment, I think it's less about Biden and Trump and more about telling the truth around um, what this society has done, um, particularly to people of color and women and queer folks. Um, and also, I think it's a time for white people to come uh, to have a come to Jesus moment or, or come, to, come to the truth about um, the, the fact that, um, you know, where we are now politically is not because, you know, Trump got in and he's such a bad person. That might be true, but Trump is a manifestation of, um, history. This, this kind of like, you know, uh, theft, unwillingness to tell the truth about it. Uh, constant lies about it, you know, incompetence, right? It is it's what people of color experience when we deal with white people. People who come to our communities and, you know, essentially, um, or come to our countries, you know, offer some half-baked theory, you know, about whatever it is they're offering. So this moment, I really, you know, can't express, it, you know, more uh, about how I feel about this. Like this moment has to be a time for us to take stock in our history, to take a break, to hear what people are saying that they want for their communities and quit, you know, trying to push what we want for other people's communities. I think it's also um, time for, you know, us to, to really empower uh, some of the younger people who are doing this work um, because they have to live with this society. Um, so, you know, for me um, in this moment, um, you know, I've been thinking and reflecting a lot about my priorities, like, you know, coming up uh, for this election. Um, and, you know, what I've proposed to people, um, you know, in policy circles is what would it be like if the United States had um, communities around the country uh, doing truth processes? And, you know, that's actually happening right now. Um, I can count probably about 20 cities around the country that are um, creating some kind of truth uh, process to tell the stories about like uh, things that happen that people haven't uh, been talking about. And some of some examples of, of, of commissions that have recently happened are um, for instance, in Maine, uh, there was a truth commission around boarding schools uh, where indigenous people have been uh, put in boarding schools essentially to take their culture away. 
Um, and right now there's there's a true commission happening in the in San Francisco, in Philadelphia, um, and I want to say Boston. And they're very narrow truth commissions that are focused on prosecutor prosecutorial misconduct, I believe. Um, and some and that came out of uh, the protest after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's murders. Um, but what I really believe is that we need a process that's connected to reparations. Um, a truth telling process where communities uh, can, you know, have people who've been victimized by state violence and uh, racism to share their experiences and stories. Um, while at the same time, there is a truth seeking process um, that is looking at um, the role of individuals in this work, the role of families in benefiting from state violence, the role of uh, government at every level, the role of businesses at every level. And the reason why there should be a truth seeking process alongside a truth telling process um, is because um, it should be connected to reparations. And um, the work that I've been really passionate around is a result of the work that we did in the truth telling project. Um, and we did the truth telling where people came and told their stories about police violence, but I had always been, um, I've always felt some kind of way, like when, when I would sit and listen to people talk about um, a relative who was killed by police. And on one hand, I thought it was healing for the people, especially the way that we offered a space as sacred um, and they weren't questioned by you know uh, people who um, were just trying to clarify some minute point um, but it was we created these very kind of like sacred community processes where we value the stories that people were telling a lot of white people came to these um, these hearings, and many uh, would would be crying and talking to me as um, they left. And you know, I was really, I re really began thinking that reparations was even more important in those moments. That white people crying came to me. Because, you know, I, I, I think on one hand, it's, it's one thing to hear the truth, but another thing to be accountable for it. And in this kind of historical, like, narrative I've been trying to share, one of the things that we've always missed is accountability. And so I began thinking that reparations had to be part of a seamless truth-telling, truth-seeking repair process. Because what would happen if this country was accountable to slavery and the history that slavery created or the world that we are living out that slavery created? And you know, I'm not just talking about like reparations that um, that's saying cut my check. Yeah, yeah, cut my check. I want my 40 acres. I want all of that. But I'm talking about a, 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 a holistic approach to reparations. And I found that in 2009, when we launched um, the reparations campaign. We, we called it, we launched it with um, FOR and Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. 
and in COBRA and another number of organizations. And we launched this campaign because we, we, wanted, um, we wanted people to see their own relationship to slavery and the world that it created. From, from our viewpoint, we saw that just being white in this country, you owe reparations, even if you just got off the boat. Because just by being white, you benefit from the world that slavery made, right off the bat. And I named some of the things like, for instance, Center for Investigative Journalism, um, their report where they just looked at mortgages, who got the mortgages. And they found that um, white people, even with worse credit and no money, were more likely to get a loan, um, even if uh, the Black person had more money, more cash on hand, or better credit. Um, but, it, but it's not just that. It is when I get pulled over by the police, it's a direct correlation between me getting pulled over by the police and policy that has police not enforcing basic laws that Black people, Brown people are over enforced under or jobs. Let's talk about jobs, right? We can talk about, you know, I remember in one of my, maybe I shouldn't go there, but one of my first academic appointment, I got an evaluation um, for an online course I taught that said that, um, that um, it wasn't as good as the other courses that I taught. And so my boss came to me and was like, hey, you know, we're just like figuring out next year and we decided that we're not gonna offer you a position because, you know, it looks like your progress had, had went down. The crazy part is, is that my colleague came to me later and is like, you know, I told her that was racist because your online scores, which are bad, are better than everybody else's in the department because we all typically do worse on online courses. But if we think about like, you know, how that process works, how employment works, how getting looked at in this society um, for a job, for all kinds of things, like depend on your race or have a huge part of your race. So for me, we've been fucking polarized. If you're not white in this society, you've been on one side of things. And for me, white people are just catching up. So we thought about reparations as a healing process, particularly if reparations as defined by the United Nations um, Development Program looks as, at reparations as restitution, which is return of what was stolen, compensation, right? Uh, moral and material damages, healing, which involves mental, spiritual and physical given the, the, the trauma that is a result of um, slavery in the world that it created. Um, as well, think about the theft of religion and spirituality. The reason why I opened this call today with um, thinking about our ancestors, satisfaction is um, looking at reparations are, are part of reparations as education, memorial building, tearing down racist monuments, um, so telling the truth about history, and then guarantees of non-repeat. And, and guarantees of non-repeat is essentially transforming the, the system so that um, the laws have changed, 
the structures have changed, people's education has changed in ways that you won't repeat the same harm. So for me, you know, I see truth telling and reparations as a seamless process because without uh, accountability, the truth doesn't really matter. Could you imagine if, if the United States paid reparations to black people for slavery? This would mean that we could be accountable to ourselves for one of the, the founding moral harms of this nation. And we would be open to all of the coups, the interference in other governments, for instance, the colonization of Israel, I mean, of Palestine by Israel, like we would be accountable and we would be paying reparations for the all but two countries in Latin America that the US has had a part in uh, overthrowing a government or um, um, sort of, you know, some kind of coup. And so it, it doesn't matter who the president is from my perspective. Trump is essentially the chickens coming home to roost. It is white folks being showed themselves. That's why people were dancing in the streets because they saw themselves, they didn't like it, let's get rid of it. But there are deeper structural issues to deal with. And I think that truth telling and reparations um, could be the first step in it. That's what I gotta say. We'd love to hear what folks are thinking. Well, let me thank you for a brilliant presentation. Um, really going for a deep dive in how uh, polarization is actually just a reflection of a long history that has been going in this direction. Um, I think puts us into a really rich environment for um, expanding the conversation about where do we go from here, which is I think one of the key questions. Um, and uh, while people are thinking about their questions and their comments, um, let me like make a little opportunity for you to make a plug that um, I think is really helpful. But um, there's a couple of recommendations I know you have, like follow you and read Yes Magazine. Um, but what are the other things that you think anybody listening today should get get to doing right now, like to stay on top of things? I, you know, um, I would go to uh, reparationsforslavery.com and the, the author of this website has a way that white people can take a um, racial justice inventory to see, you know, how they benefited from this racist system. Yeah, I, I really think that reparations and truth telling is a spiritual practice um, of facing oneself and facing one's complicity. I think that um, we all have various like um, levels of complicity in the way this system um, operates and extracts from people. Um, so, um, maybe doing some internal work um, is I think what's necessary and especially for this group because um, we're the one teaching about peace um, and justice and we haven't um, reckoned with who we are and our, our part in the system, the ways that we benefit from the system, the ways that other people um, suffer under the system um, if we don't see that as connected to how we're living, then I think we're in trouble.
So I just said a lot. Let me put this up here. <clears throat> Dave, you reminded me of something that I had almost forgotten about. Um, when my husband and I first came to Alliance for me to start my job at Mount Union, and we found a house and the loan officer at the local bank happened to have an appointment. My husband is white, I should say. And we didn't even have to talk about it. He was gonna to go to the bank and apply for the loan. I was gonna stay at home, take care of our child. Um, and I think about, look back on that and think, we knew, we didn't have to talk about it. We just knew. And the, 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 the ironic thing is some 20 years later, lovely, older, retired woman asked if she could audit my African-American literature class. And I said, sure. And at the end of the first day, she came up to me at the end of the class and she said, you know, I think I interviewed your husband for your loan. And she was really, she was, I could see that she was taken aback by my name when she met me because Colin Sibley is not, a, you know, a really common name. It had never occurred to her until she met me that I was black and my husband was white. And it was a very interesting semester. She turned out to be a delightful student who worked really hard and wanted to learn things. But it, you know, it had me thinking 20 some odd years before we ever met. Our unspoken agreement was the white partner would go fill out the mortgage application, which was approved in 24 hours. And I sometimes wonder if it would have been different had we gone together or if I had gone alone. So just, you had me thinking about that and remembering that and, you know, that's the systemic part that people don't want to talk about. Right. And, you know, I, I think there's another systemic part too. And I'm glad you said that it is the, the and, and people, all of us who do this work in peace studies, we have a sense of the way that our tax dollars are essentially used to... Mm -hmm you know, for really bad things, for war, um, for usurping democracy around the world, for colonization in Palestine. Um, but, but also like, you know, the cons our consumer dollars, you know, are, you know, and I'll give an example, uh, brawny paper towels mm -hmm. owned by the Koch brothers mm -hmm. and the Koch Brothers, as we know, you know, major supporters of American legislative uh, committee, uh, or, or it's not committee, but um, council. Mm -hmm. And they introduce thousands of bills uh, over the last decade uh, to essentially like undercut public infrastructure. Um, but that what that looks like is racist policies. It looks like austerity in Detroit. It looks like lead in the water in Flint. Um, it looks like, um, you know, companies like Nestle getting water when communities of color can't have access to it. Um, and and so like, you know, on one hand, there's that like direct race right kind of structure that you know you don't get a, a loan um because you're black um um or you know you get pulled over by police you get it um you know more likely to get an audit more likely to get um according to ProPublica you're more likely to get debt collectors after you if you're black and the list goes on and on and on but you know this, this country, you know, we're like, we've been so silent um, about the way that all of us, you know, to a large extent benefit from um, injustice, 
right? Um, and and in in this in in terms of this conversation, um, you know, white people haven't had to speak up about this stuff. Um, they haven't had to, you know, when when Trump won in two thousand. Uh, 16, I was living in Brooklyn and one of my friends who is probably friends with most of the people on this call was staying with uh, me and my partner. And, you know, he cried the whole night. Um, and, you know, he woke up in the morning, when we woke up in the morning, he was still kind of crying. And what we had, you know, we, we kind of, I knew Trump was going to win. I can't like I, you know, I told my I told the taxi driver the day before, oh, Trump, Trump is gonna win. This is this country. Yeah, and I had just been living in central Pennsylvania and had like one of the, you know, racist experiences teaching at a at a college. And and you know, it wasn't just the people in central Pennsylvania, it was the educated white folks. It was the fact that white people in my own life refuse to tell the truth about the shit that's going on. People in our field, like the peace folks are finally looking at structural violence and police violence here as part of the peace movement. It should have been fucking a part of what we've been doing. We shouldn't be talking about it now that there's big money in restorative justice programs in the US in US cities now, or that truth and reconciliation is a something that's quantifiable in that in terms of us doing some research or, you know, that's that's essentially the only reason, you know, why I believe that, you know, we become interested in stuff like that. Is there a bottom line to it? And so yeah. I, you know, it's, it's, this is a lot of what I've been thinking about, which is why, you know, William asked me to write something um, for PJSA. And this has always been one of my, you know, difficult places to like really share things because of what I believe we as a field miss the mark on so much. I still remember that little college in the middle of Pennsylvania. Yeah. That was where I met you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Come on, yeah. I know y'all got some shit to say. <laughs> well, I'll just say that I went to bed that night telling my husband Trump was going to win. And yeah. he said, no, he's not. I said, yeah, I don't need to stay up. Yeah. I know he's going to win. Um, and I woke up the next morning and he looked at me and said, you were right. Yeah. And what I told my friend was, you know, maybe next time, you know, you'll spend some time talking to your family. You know, <laughs> spend time working with your family um, and working on white trauma. Mm -hmm. My last moment um, before the election that I re remember visibly is the white supremacist in class who really called an end to it in like the last kind of minute of our discussion by saying, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised with how many of us are tired of apologizing because we think some races and some cultures are better than others. And I was like, I promised we wouldn't have any debate. See you guys on Thursday. We'll see who is right. And he wasn't in class on Thursday and people were like, what happened? And I was like, well, we know whose prediction was right. <laughs> um, 
you talked about Pennsylvania. One of our last keynotes um, talked about his experience of a hate crime um, in Pennsylvania, um, where he was targeted because of the color of his skin and the individual's um, perception of how he prayed and who he worshipped and so forth. And on the one hand, he can't say exactly how the dots between he's wearing a mega hat and he's firing his 357 revolver in their direction and saying, I'll bury you in the river. But it's undeniable at the same time. And the only way that I uh, have to compare any of my experiences is the time that I thought the brutalization was going to be horrible and when I was being attacked for being a race traitor. Mm. I don't know how we connect those dots. I don't know if you have any help for how we strategize about how we connect the dots between the microaggression of the not really bothered by white supremacy versus the overt aggression of we actually want to get rid of everyone who doesn't look like us. But nobody else is asking questions, so I will. No, yeah, I, I think, you know, number one is definitely white people's work, you know, to, to be doing this work. And then um, also, um, I think it's a lot of it is um, I think it is reconnection to, to ancestor, ancestry and the planet. Um, one of the things that was against all reason when like Jan Brewer and more recently Trump, you know, decided that, you know, ethnic studies are illegal and anti-democratic is that the studies that show when people explore their history, you know, um, their, their connection, their ethnicity, that they actually get more tuned into who they really are and connected to other people. Um, and there's also like lost spirituality in that too. So, you know, I think that, you know, I think that the way the system has been set up, it is, cr and, and trauma that white people experience um, through the process of colonization, through the this historical like running away from, you know, to a, a new world, um, they missed um, that kind of reckoning with that history that passed. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the internal work is the most important work um, for me in this moment. And it's the reconnecting with ancestors and where white people are like reconnecting, not just with this history that says, oh, I was Irish, I'm gonna go get a Celt, but like reconnecting with the immediate history of family members and relatives um, who've gone before us, who benefited from slavery, who benefited from oppression of people, like healing that trauma. And so, you know, the, the racists out there are kind of, you know, people who are like outwardly racist are really sort of just acting out of um, this, like not knowing where to go with being white. It's nothing wrong with being white, right? It is, you know, um, so if, if, if people are reconnecting in those ways, um, you know, I think that's, you know, the first step. And, and really like, as a culture, if white culture or, or, you know, white people can collectively stand up more uh, to the stuff that's happening, um, not just when there's an election coming or when somebody gets killed, but what if, you know, part of people's personal rituals are, um, you know, responding to, um, you know, racist behavior by other white people, wherever it is. Um, 
you know, doing things around uh, equity, redistribution of resources. Like those are, I think, the things that like mean a whole lot. And somebody wants to say good night. Say hi. Hi. Okay, go to bed. Um, I'm saying, but I'm saying good night. 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 Hey, Nydia. Okay. How do you... Yeah, so, I, yeah. I... No. Yeah, I definitely think, you know, truth telling is different depending on state cultural context. Um, you know, we did, a, we did a project with the Navajo Nation um, and, you know, we were really, and of course they were, really insisting that like the only thing we can do in terms of truth telling is share what we did and share our process. Uh, we can't uh, adapt it. You know, if people find things useful from things that we did as a truth telling process, then great. But um, I, I really think that this is the moment of like thinking small and thinking about uh, our own communities and thinking about how, of course, how we're connected to other communities, but like scaling up and, you know, being all things to all people is deeply problematic. But yeah, I, you know, this election and getting back on social media after six years may realize how much, yeah, I think, yeah, no. Yeah, ignorance is, has this is this has been like the in one of the most intense times of like uh, polarization in terms of just media, uh, in terms of the way that um, you know we're all being like sectioned on Facebook, for instance, in in one little area. So you're only speaking to one group of people, but then half the stuff we're getting is not true and. You know, it's just this this moment of no truth. Like, what is truth? You know, or post truth? I mean, but there is truth, right? And and I think I think if you don't if, if you don't take anything else from this conversation, take that uh, truth telling is is a decolonial effort, especially if you're listening to and being led by stories. Uh, and experience uh, of people from impacted communities. And the specificity of the story is important because they tell us what's important in people's lives. Um, they tell us about what makes people feel like dignified uh, or people with dignity. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, can you hear me or no? Yeah. Hey. Oh, hey, hey. I, I think I, I, I think my mic wasn't working because I was trying to talk earlier and I was like, nobody is reacting. Um, so no, yeah, I think, you know, what you're saying is true. But I, and I think the other thing I've, I've observed um, is just how it feels like it's, um, it's like very time intensive to figure out the truth right now. Right. Like, and, you know, a lot of people who are most affected by um, these policies and like these different, uh, you know, by these systems of oppression don't necessarily have the time to go read like eight sources to figure out what's true, right? And, you know, at least with stories, I mean, someone's telling their story, you can't say that that's right, like there's truth to a person's story, but how, how do you also think about like sort of merging, uh, connecting people's stories to then like policy or, you know, that next step, right? Um, I mean, I think it's, I think, it's helpful, right? Policymakers, they what do they call it? The the dance, like when they bring in activists and people from communities, so they can get the authentic person and the story to tell to turn it into policy. 
So I think, you know, stories are really important because, you know, they, they tell us about people's lives, um, but it, it matters like who you're listening to. Um, and it, and I think, you know, it's not just the story itself, but like the story can give you a window into like a lot of the, the data that's out there. Um, you know, I just think we're in a complex time. And I also think that it's really important, like the space of intuition, the space of like, um, you know, what, what, what our mothers, you know, grandmothers told us, like there's truth there, um, especially in women's knowledge, women's ways of knowing. So I think we got to like, I think, listen to our gut more. Um, you know, I think, um, and, and listen to our gut. And when we find ourselves in, in places where we're not afraid, uh, where we can have a little bit of ease. Um, and also, yeah, listen, listen to, I listen to black queer women, you know, that's my North star. Um, so yeah, I listen, you know, um, and then Jenny um, writes, was there a specific racial inventory, racial justice inventory you were referring to a link maybe? Um, and it is reparations for slavery. Nydia, was that helpful? Yeah, no, it's good to, to think about like, how do you curate the stories, you know, in a responsible way. Your comments about us needing to be self reflective. If we don't know who we are, we can't hear other stories. And that does, as Nani was saying, it, it gets also to the stories. And I was reading um, Strangers in Their Own Land Anger and Mourning on the Religious Right. Have you mm. heard of that book? I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. And she um, Aria uh, Hoschild, Russell Hoschild, she's a sociologist at UC Berkeley and she was trying to understand the Tea Party folk mm. and why is it they seem to be voting against some of their self-interest and she uses this term that I've really latched on to. She goes, it's the, the deep story. The deep story is the story that feelings tell and it's not grounded in logic and reason. And that's why when we see people saying things or doing things, it doesn't make any sense, but it's touching on this deep story. And the more I've thought about it, it's like, we all have that. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, a matter of figuring out what that is. And until I know what mine is, I'm not going to necessarily be able to hear yours. Right. You know, or I'm going to react to it as opposed to being able to fully listen and be present. Mm -hmm. And by knowing where I am and who I am, I can do that better. I, I mean, that's, something I've been thinking about. So thank you. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, it, which is, is so interesting. When I was in Pennsylvania, I was talking to this guy and I asked him, I said, um, he had a Confederate flag on his truck. I said, so what's up with the Confederate flag? You from the South? Like, no, I'm from here. You know, he started talking about like um, heritage and, you know, I, I was just like, so, what do you know about your heritage? Like he couldn't really, you know, like speak to it. And and I and I definitely think, you know, people when there's an absence of something, they'll go find, right? Something. And I and I think like the American story like is really thin. Like the American narrative of like. George Washington was this, Lincoln was this, Martin Luther King was, like, it's really thin, you know? Um, and, you know, people are, people are looking for something to, to connect themselves and to situate their identity in. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think is is really important to try to um, get people to talk and reconnect with something deeper. Um, yeah, I think in this moment we're screwed, but um, you well, know, hopefully the Buddha is right that this too shall pass. It's yeah, all it'll, it'll pass eventually. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> Other questions and comments? No. Well, I was going to say, I don't know if we should stop the recording and if anybody wants to be more raw, um, if, if that's a limiting factor. I know there is a couple more comments that made it to the chat. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions, in part because I know I have a lot. Um, And so one of the questions about the story that came up in our storytelling month, and th this has been something that's interesting the way the intersection happens. Um, I do remember you telling me that you couldn't have the piece printed because it was too angry. Yeah. Um, reparations is important enough and it will be in our healing issue because there was there are other people who think about it. Um, and the spoiler here is that the title is Payback, which is interesting <laughs> in its own regard. Um, but uh, so Michelle, Colin Sibley and I presented along with this individual on a panel. And it's one of the most provocative examples that I know of for structural violence because of its simplicity. but. It wasn't part of the presentation, it was part of an answer. And he said about a great, I believe it was a great, great grandmother. She died while being moved from a whites only to a serves colored people hospital of appendicitis. A completely and easily treatable condition if people are willing to examine it and so when I was editing this piece, not to, again, blow the cover of the story, <laughs> um, he didn't write about the personal. And I was like, can you make some of the personal into the political here? In part because I know his story, but I didn't want to tell him when, how, or why to share the story. But I don't have any idea like how to do some of this stuff on my own. I don't know if that makes sense, but how 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 do we do a better job of talking about reparations i think i think we you know so the conversation about reparations in the united states is like often around hr 40 right um and often around compensation um and often about the past and you know, as Coates put it, as other people put it, you know, reparations is about um, being accountable for the, the world that slavery made, right? Slavery in the world that it made. But it's also about uh, more than money. You know, it is, it is I think, um, I've always, like when, like that reparations, um, series for Yes Magazine, the first article was called Reparations is a Peace Treaty. And it's because I, I think that for me, you know, Black folks have been telling, you know, America, like what, what we need forever, you know, since we've been here. Um, and that's just not been uh, listened to. And then, and then also like, if reparations is actually going to be a thing, white people have to have skin in the game. So that means um, every white person on this call needs to be thinking about how they're making repair. Um, because it is, and also it's a spiritual matter. Like if people believe in an afterlife, um, how does anybody with any modicum of faith go to their creator? 
and say, well, I was only complicit. Mm -hmm. So like, and so part of the work of reparation is actually unraveling ourselves from the complicity of the system. Um, and that includes helping people heal from the trauma of slavery, healing from your own historical trauma that you inherited, um, like religions coming to bear about like, for instance, propagating the slave Bible, which removed all um, references to freedom. Um, reparations is a, it's an Afrofuturistic prospect, given that the, you know, the United States has been a part of educating the world about who Black people are through our media. Uh, in Germany in 2019, there was an Afrofuturism conference at one of the major museums with no Black people in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And for me, what that means is, is that our culture, our histories is a collectible, but our bodies are not welcome. And, you know, for so reparations has to be about re-educating the world about Blackness and the way that Europe, you know, for instance, um, has, you know, or, or, you know, Germany, for instance, study, and I, and I have a paper coming out in the next issue of International um, Human Rights, um, talking about how Germany studied um, the United States legal code um, to figure out how to put in um, racial um, hierarchies into the German government. So they study for us from us. And um, so yeah, like reparations, I think is a profound possibility that has, if we look at, you know, either NARC's 10 point plan or the UN development agency that talks about compensation, um, restitution, satisfaction, uh, healing and guarantees of non-repeat. Like for me, that's that's a holistic process that I think should be incorporated into how we are trying to walk through the world and unravel ourselves from from this this shit. And you know, somebody, let me just say this. Like one of the reasons why I curse so much is because. I think um, I have no respect for our system. I have no respect for, um, you know, many of the nonprofits rooted in this Western liberal democracy or the universities and colleges that um, essentially benefit, you know, from from no taxes and don't do shit uh, for the communities surrounding them. Um, you know, and I think that we should adopt a less respectful attitude toward this fucking system. So, you know, I definitely think reparations is about turning some shit around um, and doing more than what people purported doing.